All right, and welcome once again there, wrestling fans of the world. I am Bobby Munson, and with me on the line here for another edition of Ring Respect is the man with the angelic voice. He is my co-host, my partner in crime, and my video bro here on the Video Bros Network, Papa Smokes. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good, Munson. How are all the wrestling people doing out there? Let's hope everybody's keeping healthy and safe out there. We definitely uh, doing that ourselves. You know, some positive numbers coming here in Saskatchewan, but, you know, the world's still in a very unprecedented, uncertain time at the moment, Papa Smokes. Uh, how are you coping with uh, quarantine? What uh, What's uh, keeping Papa Smokes busy at the moment? Hey, you know what? I'm still kind of enjoying uh, isolation a little bit here. Uh, as you know, I like to just watch all my old stuff. I've been doing my readings. I've been listening to my music, and uh, I, I'm actually having a good time so far. But I'm looking back, looking forward to the the world getting back to normal, I must say. Yeah, it could be a long wait still, but we do hope that one day, uh, certainly, we get back there and then we can uh, maybe get back to some uh, good old-fashioned in-ring wrestling with some uh, live audiences as well, too. Speaking of live audiences, that is going to be one of the major topics on the show here today. We're going to be talking about the empty arena matches. We also got some news revolving around uh, tag team situation on the independent scene. And then we're also going to head on over to the Ring Respect Retro side. And on the Retro today, Papa Smokes, what do you got in store for us? You know, I thought it would be timely to uh, do a discussion of uh, managers in professional wrestling, uh, some of the ones from the past, and then uh, maybe talk a little bit about why uh, they aren't so prevalent in, the, in wrestling today. It's going to make for one hell of a topic here, Papa Smokes. I'm looking forward to that part of the show. But as I said, we're going to start the show off talking about the empty arena matches. But before we get into that, we're going to go ahead and ask all of you to do us a favor and click the subscribe button down below and turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release new material here on the Video Bros Network. So, what we're going to get into now is the Ring Respects portion of the show here, Papa Smokes, talking about the empty arena matches. And this was a subject that I wanted to talk a little bit about because uh, just recently we've seen some of uh, the major promotions, in particular the WWE, doing some empty arena uh, matches and stuff like that, including uh, the recent WrestleMania that took place there. But I wanted to dig a little bit more into the history, a little bit more into what's... Uh, been involved with the empty arena matches over the years and maybe go over a little bit of that uh, here with people today and uh, first of all before we even get into that I know you're not uh, big on the uh, dub stuff too much there but did you see any of what uh, went down at Wrestlemania there did you catch any of that at all recently um, I watched a couple of matches uh, yeah I did and uh, it it to be quite honest, I find wrestling to look weird in a in a setting with no fans. Uh, it's something to get used to, but um, at this time, I mean, what what else are you going to do? Uh, there's uh, uh, some other companies have shut down completely uh, for the term of this uh, COVID uh, situation, and uh, so wrestling fans, we got to watch it in an empty arenas for right now. That's definitely true. So we uh, went back and we did a little bit of digging into the history of the empty arena matches and stuff like that. And the first one I came across in my research there, Papa Smokes, was uh, between Jerry Lawler and Terry Funk. And it took place in the Mid-South Coliseum. A little bit of history behind that one. Uh, did you have a chance to witness this one at all? Yeah, absolutely. I've seen that one before in the past, actually. Uh from uh, April 21st, 1981. Uh, to me, that's the first uh, empty arena match I know that, that took place on any kind of a, a scale or, or on a company's TV show. So uh, that, that's probably a good place to start. And this one, uh, this this was one that uh, Terry Funk actually called for. And uh, if you w go back and watch, I'll try to put the link down in the description on YouTube, that Terry Funk actually comes out cutting a promo saying that, you know, you know, where is Lawler? He's calling him out, wondering where he is, asking the uh, the commentator on hand there where it is and saying that Lawler basically didn't have the nerve to step up into that empty arena for a fight. And, I mean, this one, it almost becomes more of a, a brawl more than anything. There isn't a whole lot of technical wrestling that you see take place between these two individuals in this particular matchup. No, it's a grudge match. Uh, I don't think anyone was expecting too much uh, wrestling, wrestling to go on during that. But uh, talking about Funk's promos beforehand, it, isn't that hilarious uh, uh, how good his words are before that? And then also uh, that those of the commentator, Lance Russell, of course, one of the 
greats of wrestling commentary of the past. And uh, if you watch the extended version, uh, I was particularly tickled at how much uh, Lance Russell was smoking cigarettes before that uh, <laughs> match uh, in the empty arena. I guess that was one benefit for Lance. Yeah, back in the days when you actually could do that in the arenas. <laughs> uh, it seems like uh, Terry Funk would not be, uh, this would not be the end of the empty arena matches for him because the next one I actually came across was one that uh, he did in uh, what was called the Texas Bunkhouse Empty Arena Cage Match. And that one uh, yeah. that one was against a, uh, I believe it was uh, Bruce Walkup, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. In that particular, I guess you could call it a, a, a squash match if you go back and watch this one. It doesn't last a, too particularly long. Um, yeah, I watched that one too. Um, I think, uh, first of all, from, from the Mid-South one, I, I think that uh, the idea or the concept for the empty, empty arena match came from uh, uh, Bill Watts and Jerry Jarrett, who were, of course, uh, huge uh Bookers and uh, and management of uh, Mid South Wrestling and also uh, uh, Houston Wrestling back in the day and uh, and uh, I believe that's probably where that came from the 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 wrestling genius of those two minds and uh, yeah I think uh, I have the feeling that Funk was was uh, was enjoyed that and thought it was a good concept and uh, wanted to continue it on in Texas there with some other I think he even had a few other empty arena matches uh the, these ones not being as famous though because they weren't on tv like the uh the one in memphis definitely and uh one thing i'm going to notice a uh, couple of things i like and dislike about the empty arena matches i do prefer the ones where the uh the audience area is a little bit more uh dark lit i like the focus to be on the actual action going on so that it takes away from the idea that it even is an empty arena to begin with i think that kind of adds a little bit more to the actual match itself the other thing i'm really missing though is that, that that crowd noise that goes on is actually very instrumental in the excitement of watching a wrestling match in particular if you ask me yeah i think so too uh, uh part of the uh part of the draw of having a, the fans there is that uh this their reaction to the act to the uh action that's going on in the ring and, and uh a lot of the times, the it's quite obvious uh, uh, either how into it or not into it uh, uh, the fans are by their reactions during the matches. So I think that has a, an effect on on the viewer as well, uh, the person watching on TV. So uh, yeah, I, it's an interesting concept and uh, it got going for a while there. But uh, you know, I, I I prefer it with the crowd. But uh, I, I think promotion using that concept once in a while is is, uh, is an okay idea. And speaking of an okay idea, one of the next ones that I actually came across when I was doing a little research into this uh, actually comes from the mid-90s and something that WCW experimented with a little bit during the WCW Saturday night uh, events when the uh, NWO were starting to become very prominent and they were really trying to push this idea. They did a bunch of taped segments uh, using Hall and Nash, the Outsiders, doing tag team matches against local talent jobber, uh, you know, developmental type talents and stuff like that. These were empty arena matches, but the thing I did like about these ones in particular when I went back and watched them was, I mean, they were partially gimmicked for the fun of the NWO at the time, but the other part was, was because of that fun factor, they were able to add in old crowd noises from previous events and stuff like that, which actually kind of added to the fun and interest of these particular matches, even though the matches themselves aren't of the most outstanding quality the, from the list that we've seen here. Yeah, for me, though, I, I, it kind of begs the question that, that why would you bother pumping in uh, canned crowd noise if you're just doing an empty arena match anyway? Like, uh, I presume that WCW was running those at, at the time for some reason. Uh, I, I'm going to assume that it had to do with the talent that they couldn't be in a certain place or, or they couldn't get the combinations of wrestlers together that they wanted for certain nights so they had to run when they could when they actually didn't have a show planned for a certain city but uh, yeah I, uh, I'm left to think that it's some kind of an experiment for what's going to work on TV and what isn't and uh, uh, maybe they thought they could get away with doing a studio show without a crowd and just pumping in the crowd noise but I think it kind of comes off as hokey 
I think what they did, if I'm not mistaken, like it was actually a little bit of storyline, if I'm not mistaken, from one of the WCW events, the NWO had actually picked up a victory, allowing them a certain allotted amount of TV time on WCW Saturday night, which became, then their segments became known as NWO Saturday night. So these were intentionally filmed in front of an open stu- open crowd because the idea was that it was the NWO's studio, it was their arena and stuff like that and nobody was supposed to like them i mean these were the heel characters at the time so the idea that was no one was legitimately there and of course because they were also supposed to be members of the production and stuff like that they were able to pipe in this old noise and stuff to make it seem like there was people actually cheering and rooting for the villainous things that the nwo the and the outsiders in particular were doing at the time so i think with this one in particular it did work in a sense just because the the idea the silliness behind it and everything but i mean you are right if you are going to run an empty arena show mostly you're not going to want to pipe in that crowd noise intentionally because it's it's not natural at that point yeah your your reasoning makes sense to me though i I, I knew there was a reason for it i just wasn't sure yeah that makes a lot of sense to me yeah so moving on from there uh, another couple that i found out actually came from tna wrestling we haven't really ever spoken about tna wrestling here on the show in our entire history but hey why not we're going with it today so a couple of them there that uh saw one was between sting and kurt angle and uh you know it Two intel, you know, incredible talents. I mean, Sting and Kurt Angle. We know both, you know, great that in ring talents. But man, I don't know if you watched this one, Papa Smokes, but the finish to this match just it it made it just kill every bit of momentum that it would have had for an empty arena match at this point. Uh, enlighten me a bit, Munson. I, I I can't recall the finish of that match at this time. All right, so in the finish or whatever, there's a little bit more story to this. I'm not I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the story itself, but the idea uh, Sting and Kurt Angle, they've got their differences, but they're supposed to be on the same side in some sort of faction. And then Scott Steiner and Kevin, uh, Kevin Nash are also supposed to be part of this faction as well, too. And at the end, after these two have totally beaten the piss out of each other for the last 10 minutes, Steiner and uh, Nash come down and, you know, basically stop the fight between the two of them and just have them kind of, you know, dust it off, walk away from the whole thing as if nothing ever happened, you know, let's stop the fighting kind of thing. It's it's kind of a bunk ending to what was otherwise, you know, not a bad match to watch. Yeah, yeah, that reminds me now, they, they were all part of the main event mafia at that time. There we go. They were having yeah. internal problems within the faction and, uh, and yeah, I guess they just... Uh, decided on a finish like that where the peace would be kept within the faction at the time but yeah that rings weird with me I, uh, again I always I sometimes wonder if something went wrong or if they had to change their uh, their ideas at the last minute for some reason or uh, yeah that's it's definitely a wacky finish definitely was and the other one from TNA wrestling actually came with a tag team matchup it was generation me which is actually the uh, Young Bucks, for those of you who follow um, wrestling as of today. Uh, they were taking on the Motor City Machine Guns, which was Chris Saban and Alex Shelley. Uh, this match a little bit, probably a little bit more interesting, a little bit more action-packed. I mean, that's kind of what you're going to get with uh, these ty- these four in particular individuals inside the ring. You're going to get that high-flying, you're going to get that fast-paced you know, high spot type action. And if you're looking for something that's going to maybe keep you interested during a, uh, you know, an empty arena match, something that doesn't rely on the crowd to add to the story of the matchup itself and stuff like that, then you know what? This one wasn't that terrible of a match. It actually was, for the most part, a watchable match between these four individuals. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with that too, that that would be the type of match that strikes me would work particularly well in an empty arena setting for exactly the reasons you said there would be uh, many high spots uh, a lot of uh, quick action in there between those two teams I, I always thought Saban and Shelley were such an excellent tag team and uh, yeah I think that's the kind of match you probably want to have in that environment if you decide to do that because uh, it, you know, a match like that, there almost isn't time for crowd reactions. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, the viewer's uh, attention is going to be kept uh, the entire time in a, in a quick-paced match like that. Definitely so, and that's what made that one interesting. 
Now, the last one I have on my list, and then if you have any others that I might have missed, we'll go over that in a second here, Papa Smokes. But this one is actually a matchup from Japan from DDP Pro, and it took place between, and I, sorry if I don't get the pronunciations right here, Minoru Suzuki, and he was taken on Shinshiro to God, Tagaji, if that's the pronunciation. Sorry if I messed that up, anybody. Uh, let me know in the comment section below how to pronounce those names properly. But I, I don't know if you caught this one. This is actually a very, very long matchup, Papa Smokes, that took place in an empty Tokyo Dome. And this one ended up being, you know, starting as a wrestling match, spilled out into an absolute brawl. There was no ring involved either, and this thing went all over the Tokyo Dome for a good solid, I believe it's like 45, 46 minutes that the running time was on this video. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that one myself. I know both of the wrestlers you're talking about. Uh, that sounds like a good one, and uh, uh, I'll have to check that out at some point. Definitely, definitely check it out. It's uh, one of the better ones for sure. I mean, yeah, you don't have that crowd noise, but... I mean, it basically starts out in a baseball field is where it all begins, and they are putting on their wrestling holds, giving it the wrestling treatment at first, and then it spills into chaos throughout the entire arena, goes all over the Tokyo Dome, uh, utilizing their elements and stuff like that, and then brings it back to a wrestling match that wraps it all up. It's at, You know, as far as empty arena matches ones go, I would put this one towards the top of the list that I've got uh, listed here today in terms of general interest and u utilizing the uh, benefits of the empty arena. Okay, great, great. I, I have uh, one or two more here uh, that I could mention as well. There's the famous one from WWE uh, from January of 1999 when they had uh, Mankind versus The Rock for the WWF, I think it was WWF at that time, uh, title. And uh, they showed it at the uh, at halftime during the Super Bowl. That was one of uh, Vince McMahon's uh, tactics to get people to change the channel during the big game. And uh, this was an empty arena match in, in Tucson, Arizona, and it's a it was mostly a kind of a comedy hardcore match, uh, brawling all through the back, all through the arena. Uh, lots of uh, lots of kind of silliness going on. Uh, 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 the wrestlers hitting each other with uh, cartons of popcorn and, and bottles of like plastic bottles of water and, and you know appearing to be uh, so hurt from from these shots and uh, it actually ended with uh, mankind uh, taking over a forklift with a bunch of pallets on it and that he pins the rock by lowering these this uh, forklift full of pallets on top of the rock and that's how the pinfall happened. Um, it's not the kind of match that's to my tastes uh, whatsoever, but uh, apparently the ratings were quite good. Apparently a lot of people did watch this match during the halftime of the Super Bowl, so that's uh, quite a prominent one. Um, I was thinking of another recent one, very recent in fact, from uh, uh, NWA slash Impact in uh, 2018, January of 2018. Uh, Tim Storm took on Josephus oh, wow. for, uh, for a, a shot at the uh, NWA champ, who's Nick Aldis at that time. And uh, this was a pretty good one. It was a culmination of a, of a long feud, at least a half-year feud, in which Storm had been injured, and uh, Josephus had injured Storm's ribs with a ladder, et cetera, et cetera. But... Uh, it ended up with uh, Josephus taking the victory in that one, and uh, it, it's. I thought this one was filmed pretty well. I thought it uh, kept the uh, viewer quite uh, engaged throughout the whole thing. That was a good one. So 2018, and then I think we would be uh, remiss to uh, to leave out the uh, the island death match between Antonio Inoki and Masa Saito from 1987. This came to my mind. Uh, recently, because uh, if you've been following the sports news, uh, Dana White is, wants to keep running his UFC fight. I did hear about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was in danger of getting his card cancelled, so he was trying to buy a private island in, in which he could just float the rules and hold his fights there. Anyway, it, it never ended up happening, but uh, yeah, in fact, you know, he battled Saito in this on the uh, 
Ganrujima Island. Again, I'm I'm hoping the pronunciation is at least close on that, but they had had a long bloody feud before that, and uh, in which some of their matches were the due to the action, the the ring had been breaking down and, and the uh, post falling and the turnbuckles falling off and stuff. So it uh, culminated in this island match, the Highland Death Match, and it was kind of interesting because they they chose that. Ganrujima Island because it had historical significance to Japanese culture. Uh, apparently in 1612 there were two swordsmen, Sasaki and Miyamoto, who uh, had, a, had a real life feud going on and they agreed to fight on that very island with swords. So this is known, this is a, you know, a famous battle in uh, Japanese culture and Japanese history. So Inoki, uh, uh, you know, the genius promoter that he was, uh, uh, kind of bringing that into the modern day at that time in the 80s, uh, decided to uh, settle his feud with Saito on that on that island. And uh, I don't think there's much uh, video clips of it. I've seen uh, quite a lot of uh, still pictures of it, but this match went on for two hours, uh, extremely bloody, extremely violent. Uh, at one point, it's getting dark and they there's some bonfires lit and uh, Inoki throws Saito into a bonfire, which apparently <laughs> injured his eyes uh, a fair bit from that. But eventually Antonio Inoki uh, gaining the win with the sleeper hold uh, puts uh, Masa Saito out. So there's another one too that's that's quite interesting. I, I like the concept they had there, especially the historical uh, edge to it. And uh, that's one uh, we should have on our list here too. That sounds so brutally awesome. I, I wish we could find a copy of that and actually watch through that one because that, that sounds like something I'd love to do on one of these quarantined afternoons here. Yeah, it has to be televised somewhere. I, I was having trouble finding a clip of the full thing, uh, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Perfect. Well, that's gonna. We'll wrap up there on terms of the empty arena matches because you know we could go on forever about them, what we think of them, and stuff like that. But you know, we want to move on to some other topics. But before we move on to our next uh, news topic, I'm just going to uh, show the camera one quick little thing. As you can see, this is my official Prairie Pro Wrestling T-shirt that I'm wearing right here today. You can get your own Prairie Pro Wrestling T-shirt at any of the live Prairie Pro Wrestling shows as well, and. Uh, if you can't make it to a live Prairie Pro Wrestling show and you still want a t-shirt, I'm sure we could figure something out. Just uh, contact the man on the line here, Papa Smokes. He's the uh, guy who can probably make magic happen if we wanted to get something out to somebody that uh, is a Prairie Pro fan from somewhere outside of our general area there, Papa Smokes. Yeah, it sounds good. Uh, I'm the t-shirt guy. I got uh, colors, I got sizes, I got everything you need for your t-shirt need. So if you want one, get a hold of me. Definitely, you can reach Papa Smokes on uh, on Twitter or as well as uh, message us in the comment section below as well. Get the message out and we'll make sure that that happens. So we're going to move on over into a news topic here today, Pop Smokes. This is the one that uh, you sent to me just the other day about the revival getting their wwe release this has been a piece of news for quite some time that these guys have been looking for their release from the dub and uh you sent the information the other day along with a uh picture of good old jim cornett there which uh gave me a good chuckle because you know he's been a big supporter of the revival and uh it begged me to come up with the topic that with the revival now heading out on their own probably heading to the ind independent scene you know maybe they'll go over to AEW who knows but uh, it'd be nice to see them hit up the independent scene or even NWA for that matter and uh, we just uh, want to take a minute and talk a little bit about this subject and maybe give some uh, thoughts on some teams we would like to see on the independent scene or you know teams that are within some of these other companies outside of the WWE that would make for some interesting fun matches with the revival in particular. So uh, why don't you uh, let us know what you, uh, your thoughts are here, Papa Smokes. Yeah, for sure. I found that uh, quite an interesting news piece to come out to uh, something that's been speculated about for a long time. Uh, as you said, they've been, they've been asking for and waiting for their release to uh, basically rotting on the on the WWE roster, uh, not being used, uh, not being talked about. And these guys uh, have a good thing going. They're a great tag team. They're obviously, uh, even by their name, a throwback team. Uh, 
using a style that's uh, been successful in past years, highly successful, and uh, and uh, we just thought it was interesting, uh, uh, particularly uh, partly for the reason that uh, Cornette has spoken of his desire to manage these guys, and uh, and uh, yeah, it, again, it just begs the question as to where will these guys go and what will happen with them. So uh, we had a couple of ideas about. Uh, uh, places they might go and teams they might uh, encounter. Uh, you just mentioned NWA. I think that's one of the likely destinations that they might head to. Uh, as long as they come to PPW first, though, right? Pardon me? As long as they come to PPW for a couple matches first, though, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> Can you imagine the, the Revival versus uh, Western Lions? That would be a great match. I, I I think we should hook something like that up. I think that would be uh, very exciting for the people of Saskatchewan, especially once this whole quarantine lifts. Can you imagine the excitement you'd have with a match like that booked on paper? Oh, yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot, a lot of uh, wrestling organizations thinking that same thing right now. Uh, I don't think the revival will be short on uh, offers, that's for sure. That's for sure, yeah. And one of the speaking of the NWA in particular, one of the matches I think would be perfect to kind of bring the revival back into, you know, like or it's not back into, but onto the scene at the independence or some of these other companies. I want to see them take on the rock and roll express personally. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Munson, uh, even just for the historical significance of that too. Uh, obviously Morton and Gibson uh, getting on in their years, they've lost a step or two, but uh uh, you got to hand it to them. Their game, they, they still get in the ring. They still have matches against top competition and, and were recent NWA tag team champions for the 10th time or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd be right down with you to see that one. Uh, uh, and it would be a historical matchup. It definitely would be. So I've written down a couple others, but uh, did you have any in mind that you've written down there too, Papa Smokes? You want to bring up? Yeah, yeah. Um, Obviously, a recent uh, tag team championship combo was uh, the wild cards, uh, Thomas Latimer and Royce Isaacs. I like this team a whole bunch. Uh, they have uh, the uh, Latimer is the big, strong guy. Isaacs is the slightly smaller but quicker uh, and technical guy. I like their uh, style a whole bunch. I like what they've got going on. I think that would be an excellent matchup. And uh, not to mention the uh, the tag team champs right now, James Storm and Eli Drake. Yeah, uh, yeah. Another, another couple of wrestlers I like and respect a whole bunch. And, uh, man, I think they could put together a great match with the, the Revival. I think so. And I I think by what, a lot of what we're saying is that we'd really like to lean them towards the NWA by the sounds of it because they've got, you know, a tag division that makes sense, especially for a team like the Revival at the same time. I think a lot of wrestling fans out there might disagree with us. I think a lot of them want to see them go to AEW. But I think until AEW really gets their tag team division on track, I don't think that the move would suit the Revival any more than what their time in WWE was serving them, personally. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, um, I don't watch a lot of NWA, but uh, from what I can see, it, it, their tag team division looks like a mess, really. Uh, they have some good performers and some good teams, but uh, the management and the uh, the setup of the of the tag team division just it looks deplorably bad at this time. But uh, as far as AEW goes, there's a couple good matches to be had there. Like I think. Um, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy could be a good one. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan, but I, I like the way Jungle Boy works. Uh, they could, the Revival could get a lot of heat on Jungle Boy, and then, of course, Luchasaurus, the, the, the huge bulldozer-type wrestler coming in. Like I think that would be a good match. It would utilize the hot tag very, very well in that situation, for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Um, Young Bucks, again... Not to my taste in the least, but um, I think they could set up a good match with those guys. I, I'm just not sure about how they'll jive together as a, as uh, in terms of uh, setting up the match and, uh, and the various spots and stuff like that. Uh, I think that um, if done properly, that could be a good match, even just in the way that the fans want to see it, and it would be a hot match. Uh, as far as the rest of them, uh, I guess the AEW tag champs are Omega and Paige. 
that could be a good match, I suppose. Uh, and again, uh, to have an AEW title match for the Revival would, would definitely generate a lot of buzz, and I think AEW fans would be into that. But uh, I'm not sure about anybody else, to be perfectly honest. No, speaking of that, uh, let's just think about this for a minute. If they did sign with AEW Pop Smokes, and this would be a perfect segue into the Respect uh, Ring Respect retro portion of the show, but if, say, the Revival, hypothetically speaking, showed up in AEW with manager Jim Cornette at their side, the amount of heat that that would draw the second that it would happen. And I know Jim Cor- it's been mentioned on Jim Cornette's experience and everything like that before. So, I mean, it it's absolutely true. And even I think Jim Ross mentioned it on his podcast as well, too, that the heat that it would draw would be magnificent for that company. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, that That's the best kind of heat also is because it's, it's real heat. Like, there's a real dislike between uh, a lot of the people in AEW and Jim Cornette. There's mutual disgust between the two. But, I mean, business is business, right? And if you want to have a heated rivalry like that, then I, I think it would be absolutely hilarious and, and pure money to uh, to have Cornette manage them in AEW. Uh, in the reality of it, I realize business is business, but uh, I, I, I honestly can't see it happening on both sides. I, I don't think... Uh, I don't think uh, James E. Cornette would sacrifice his principles enough to, to work with the, that company. And I also think that company, AEW, in their management and uh, such would, would be interested in having Jim uh, at this point. So I, I'm not I'm not optimistic that it'll happen. But uh, and yeah, I couldn't agree more. That would be nuclear heat. It definitely would. But that's going to segue perfectly into the Ring Respect Retro topic that you have for us today, speaking of James E. Cornette. And we're talking managers of the past. So, Papa Smokes, why don't you give the fans a little look into this and uh, start us off here. Okay, sounds good. Um, We're talking about managers and some of the greats. We could talk about some of the uh, not-so-greats, too, but I think uh, I wanted to talk about some of the managers that I like, and and, uh, I'm sure you have a couple on your mind as well, Munson. So... uh, I was going to start out with uh, the Hollywood fashion plate, classy Freddie Blassie. Good choice. Um, def- yeah, definitely one of my favorites of all time. And uh, he kind of exemplifies uh, the, uh, the idea that uh, many managers, successful managers, were successful wrestlers in their day, too. And then none so true as Freddie Blassie. I mean, he started off... He started off uh, uh, in the 50s working for uh, basically uh, outlaw promotions, but then uh, he started, he was successful and started wrestling all through the United States. He worked for uh, Jess McMahon, who is, uh, of course, the grandpa of Vince McMahon, the Vince we know. And uh, then he was really, really big in uh, Southern California, in Los Angeles, working for the WWA in the 60s, which was a massive, massive promotion. If you study your wrestling history, you'll find out that the WWA used to be considered one of the one of the few world titles uh, in the world, a world championship. And uh, Blassie held that WWA belt for a number of times, uh, feuded with many famous uh, wrestlers, including the Destroyer, Luthez, Edward Carpentier, John Tolos, the Sheik, the list can go on and on. Uh, he also had a uh, great time in uh, Japan, uh, was very famous and very feared in Japan as a, as a, as a violent heel. Uh, he feuded with Riki Dozan, we all know uh, what a hero he was in Japan. This was also the time when uh, Blassie started filing his canine teeth into points so that he could bite his opponents better and bloody them better. Started uh, nicknaming him uh, Fred the Vampire Blassie. So uh, in some of his matches were so gory and so bloody, uh, uh, people were having heart attacks in the audience and stuff. He, he really got a lot, of, uh, a lot of heat going around him. And he came back to the States and worked uh, in New York for Vince McMahon Sr., uh, had title matches and uh, and main event matches in 
Madison Square Garden and such against Bruno San Martino, Obo Brazil and others. But uh, as the years went on, he uh, in his 50s, he uh, retired as an active uh, ring competitor and started managing in the 70s. And uh, he had quite the, quite the uh, list of famous wrestlers as his protégés, uh, including Nikolai Volkov, Blackjack Mulligan, Peter Maivia, who, of course, The Rock's grandpa, uh, Ray Stevens, Adrian Adonis, Jesse Ventura, George Steele, Mr. Fuji, Kamala, and early in his career as a as a heel, Hulk Hogan. Uh, the first time he appeared under that name was with uh, Lassie as his manager. So, uh, quite a quite a pedigree there, and uh, he has uh, some quite big matches under his belt as uh, as a manager too, managing the Iron Sheik when the Sheik defeated Bob Backlund for the WWF title in 1983. Uh, Backlund had held that title for six years uninterrupted or something like that. That was an epic title run. The Sheik was was the first one to dethrone him with the camel clutch and Blassie quite famous for that match. And then uh, another huge match that uh, Blassie uh, managed, which will, you know, keep him in the record books forever is, uh, Managing Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov against the USA Express, uh, Wyndham and Rotunda at WrestleMania 1. You know, obviously the, the cards don't get much bigger than that. The first WrestleMania, yeah, Blassie was there as a manager and winning the titles at that show too. So, uh, I mean, when you think about the, the uh, win-loss record and the, uh, and the, the cultural impact he made on wrestling uh, uh, all across the country and all across the world. It's just absolutely massive. And another thing I, I found out about uh, about Fred Blassie, too, is uh, he had such a good relationship with the McMahons that uh, he's actually the only man to have worked with four generations of McMahons, right from wow. Jess to Vince Sr. to Vince Jr., to Stephanie and Shane. That's that's so incredible. That yeah, isn't that an accomplishment? Isn't that something that means you have longevity in the wrestling business? That's for sure. Definitely. Yeah, it's uh, quite the quite the career that uh, Classy Freddie Blassie had. And uh, growing up myself, knew more so him uh, as a manager as opposed to knowing his wrestling career gone back and watched a lot of stuff now about his wrestling career, but man, what a career just in general that this man had spanning all those decades, all those different generations of McMahons. I mean, uh, credit to the guy for tolerating that many generations of McMahon while he's at it too. Yeah, well, he was making the money. Hey, I'm pretty sure that's why the relationship was so good. Uh, they'll always have you back if they're if you're making the money. Well, I mean, so what they're saying, what you're saying is that they need to hire the two of us to make them some money too while they're at it. <laughs> maybe Munson, maybe. We'll see what happens. Who do you got next on your list there, Pop Smokes? Okay, I'm gonna go straight to the top here with uh, I think the manager that is pretty much universally thought of as the, the greatest manager in pro wrestling history, that of course being Bobby the Brain Heenan. Of course. <laughs> uh, this, oh yeah, this is a guy that has entertained so many people uh, throughout his career. Uh, including myself as a child uh, watching the AWA matches live in the Winnipeg Arena. I mean, the, just being there, you know how I like live wrestling so much uh, more than watching it on TV. Uh, just to see how invested the crowd would get in, in heckling and mocking him and, and hating him so much. He was just a perfect character. And uh, just like we know that the managers... Uh, function in pro wrestling has always been usually to be a mouthpiece for uh, for uh, some wrestlers who aren't as gifted on the mic as others, um, especially uh, uh, large monster heel type characters who don't care much to talk. Uh, you can have that manager that, uh, that uh, says all that needs to be said. Um, Keenan started as a, as a wrestler as well, but was uh, by his own admission, uh, didn't receive uh, proper training and kind of figured out a lot of stuff on his own. So uh, his wrestling career is, is not storied uh, at all. But uh, by 1969, he uh, he came to up to Minnesota area and worked for the AWA for Vern Gagne. 
Uh, he started his uh, faction of, of wrestlers known as the Heenan family, which we all know uh, he stayed with uh, that concept throughout his entire career. Back then he had uh, Nick Bockwinkle, Ray Stevens, Blackjack Lanza, and Bobby Duncan. So a tag team and uh, and, uh, and a singles wrestler uh, to, uh, to promote towards the top of the AWA. Uh, there is an interesting anecdote from that time. I believe it was in Chicago uh, for the AWA in 1975. Uh, Bobby got the fans uh, so worked up that a fan actually pulled a gun and fired six shots at Bobby in, in the ring. Missed him with all six shots, but got some fans on the other side of the ring, uh, uh, causing a couple of fairly serious injuries. Now you know you're doing your job as a heel manager when uh, people are whipping out guns and shooting them at you, right? Like I don't think anyone is going to ever be able to have that kind of accolade in the wrestling profession anymore. Oh, good lord! Like, yeah, I could. Uh, I was aghast at that one. But he uh, was Bobby Heenan was very successful in the AWA. That I think he spent. Quite a, at least half, if not more than half, of his career working in the uh, American Wrestling Association. He had numerous uh, tag team championships with the Black Jacks, uh, with Lanza and Duncan, with Bockwinkle and Stevens. And then he managed Bockwinkle as a single singles competitor, and uh, and Bockwinkle was champ for many, many years, on and off for, for nine years or something like that. He held that belt. And with Heenan uh, proudly standing by him, it's a, and that was, of course, a world championship at that time, too, and that company was still uh, operating the kind of central states there uh, out of Minneapolis. Um, by 1984, uh, Vince McMahon Jr. and the WWF were, were poaching quite a bit of talent from the, uh, from the other areas just by their... Uh, money power being able to offer more money and, and Heenan was along with those but uh, one of the things I thought was interesting was that uh, Vince was paying some of those wrestlers more money to not give notice and just leave immediately because he wanted to negatively impact the other companies as well by, by screwing around with their plan but uh, not Bobby Heenan he was one of the only ones that uh, refused that extra money and still worked out his six-week notice out of respect for the great Vern Gagne who had, who had given him uh, basically a start as a manager and stuff. I always thought that was a pretty classy move. And uh, so, yeah, he headed up to New York and the WWF eventually uh, reformed the Heenan family. This time he had uh, uh, wrestlers including John Studd, Ken Patera, Playboy Buddy Rose, Paul Orndorff, King Kong Bundy, Andre the Giant, Rick Rude, uh, the tag team, the Brain Busters, which is Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard, Harley Race, Hercules, Haku, and Mr. Perfect. That, that's not even all of them. I'm just picking some of the main uh, stars from that. But God, think of that lineup. And pretty much all Hall of Famers and... Uh, well, wow, like the Heenan family was always something to be reckoned with uh, wherever he went and uh, causing mayhem amongst the, amongst the, the WWF uh, and just highly respected for his ability to draw these wrestlers to him. He managed to numerous tag team champs, including the Brain Busters, uh, Andre the Giant and Haku. Uh, he never managed a world champion in WWF, but two intercontinental champs, uh, ravishing Rick Rude and Mr. Perfect. So not too bad, not too bad of a of a career for accomplishments there too. Uh, known to call the call the fans and preliminary wrestlers ham and eggers, and also refer to the fans as humanoids all the time. I, People just love to hate Bobby Heenan and uh, and myself included. I, I have a great respect for the man. He, he, this is a guy who understood the business, who understood performance and the way uh, to get across to uh, the crowds of people and uh, TV audiences out there. For me, he will always be the, the, the 
number one great manager in pro wrestling. I, and I agree 100% with you there, Papa Spokes. And I also, too, will think back when I was a kid watching Bobby Heenan uh, during the WWF time, feel that maybe if it weren't for Bobby Heenan and his abilities – that Hulk Hogan might not have quite had the impact that he did. And it's not that he managed Hogan, but he managed all the major rivals that Hulk Hogan had during that major Hulkamania run that he had back in the 1980s and stuff like that. And I feel that it was Bobby Heenan's work as a manager that really added to the spec, you know, the spectacle that was these matchups, these big matchups that were designed for Hulk Hogan at the time. And, you know, it didn't matter who it was that Bobby Heenan was managing in those matches. You were paying attention to every single word that he was delivering going into those things and to really hype his man up going up against Hulk Hogan. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more on that. But the other thing was that, well, like, uh, a, a great champion is, is is only as good as his opponents were, right? But the the, the legitimacy that Keenan lent to anyone he managed also uh, also uh, contributed to that uh, entire thing. Uh, the fact that uh, if you had Keenan as your manager, people took you seriously because they knew you were one of the big uh, big guys in the territory. They knew you were probably uh, one of the top guys so to speak. And, uh, yeah, Heenan just added that sense of legitimacy. You could believe him as a manager. He, he even talked about his, uh, regimen of setting up matches and, uh, getting, getting, uh, flights and hotel rooms and, and getting the, the, uh, payouts and everything for his wrestlers. Like you believe that he did that job and that he was, he was the best at it. You definitely did. And, you know, we'll, uh, we could talk all day about Bobby Heenan. And in fact, maybe one day we'll have to do an entire show dedicated to the legacy that was Bobby Heenan because, I mean, he's absolutely one of the best and probably at the top of my list when it comes to just overall in the wrestling profession in general. Uh, but, you know, moving on from there, talking about other guys, I know we've mentioned about guys drawing heat and stuff like that, and nobody draws heat, especially in a modern day, like our uh, a personal favorite of ours, Jim Cornette. Yeah, yeah, you're right there. Cornette also was a, a student and of Bobby Heenan and a great, great admirer of Bobby Heenan. I think uh, Cornette developed a lot of his uh, persona and tricks uh, based on the great stuff he saw from Heenan. Definitely so, and I mean, and what a great uh, run of uh, guys that Cornette had backing and stuff like that too. I mean, you can go back to the, you know, the days of the Midnight Express, uh, Bobby Eaton, Stan Lane, and Heavenly Bodies, but even into the uh, the nineties where he was managing guys like Yokozuna, Owen Hart, British Bulldog, and uh, Vader for a short run as well too. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you knew that Vince just knew about Cornette down there, knew of the success, knew of the packed shows that they were doing down in uh, Mid-South Wrestling in Memphis and in Tennessee and in Kentucky and Texas, all the places that weren't WWE territory, but that uh, had devoted fans that were uh, completely uh, absorbed by the by the product that they were watching. And uh, yeah, they, uh, if you remember when Cornette debuted for WWE, it was, it was Heenan that brought him out. Heenan was on his way out. But Heenan brought him in and, and introduced Cornette as the greatest manager in professional wrestling today. Uh, much to Jim's embarrassment, I'm sure. But uh, man, when you get a when you get a recommendation like that, you know it means something. Definitely so, and I mean, yeah, he's had a lot of accolades over the years, and uh, still continues to draw that heat, just not in the same way and on the managerial role, but definitely within his podcast, he's. Uh, Definitely not making any friends, so to speak, necessarily, but definitely a lot of enemies within the world of professional wrestling at the moment. But at the same time, I, I really do think he has a lot to offer if uh, people haven't gone and checked out his particular podcast. I mean, whether you always agree with what the man says, you can, uh, you can sit there and listen to the podcast and get a lot of great historical information as well, too. Yeah, that's true. And, and it's just testament to uh, Cornette's understanding of the entire wrestling business that he hasn't even been a performer in years now and, and a lot of people consider him the top heel in, in wrestling and it's because he speaks uh, what he believes to be the truth uh, with uh, with no qualifiers uh, uh, 
he speaks his mind the way he the way he thinks it, the way he sees it, and uh, he's not taking any guff from anybody. And uh, you know, just as, as any uh, person that's opinionated opinionated that speaks their mind, they're going to have those that don't agree and uh, and de- and want to detract from that. But uh, to be honest, his experience in the business from uh, from being a starting as a ringside photographer as a teenager, but through to uh, being a manager at a young age for a long time, and that he's done every job there is to do in in professional wrestling, including promoter, booker, uh, TV producer, uh, all that stuff. He understands the all the minute details of television production and. Uh, and uh, the way that wrestling uh, needs to get across on television to uh, audiences, and uh, the man quite simply understands the business like like pretty much no one else alive right now. I think, and it's something definitely that I admire too, because I mean those are all aspects of which uh, you know that I do yeah, within the wrestling industry or trying to anyway. I mean, I started off just uh, being a ringside writer and stuff like that you know it worked my way in started to do the video production and everything like that you know you know worked our way into having this uh, podcast as well too so a lot that i admire about jim Cornette and the way he's handled himself in the wrestling industry again disclaimer not that everybody agrees with everything he says 100 percent. so everybody out there before you jump the gun and start hating on us here we're just saying that the man has a lot to offer in terms of knowledge and respect for what he's done within the industry, whether you agree with uh, all of what he says or not. So, but. yeah, I, I can't help but having a chuckle here. I'm sure a few of our listeners are, have been rolling their eyes at this segment a little bit here, but uh, all all joking and personal opinion aside, uh, his contributions to wrestling just simply can't be questioned. He, he's one of the greats for sure. Definitely so. So, uh, who else can you uh, tell us about in the world of managerial history here, Pop Smokes? Well, of course, like we aren't going to have time on this program to go through all the greats. Uh, that there are even, uh, you know, there, there's uh, some from the past that are that are still active, such as a Paul Heyman, who has done a, a great deal in the wrestling business, uh, operating out of New Jersey. Uh, as a promoter starting the ECW, but being a manager character within that as well. And of course, we all know he's been uh, managing Brock Lesnar, uh, sometimes with the WWE Championship, sometimes without. But that guy has a, has a definite mastery of uh, of the uh, managerial game. There's, of course, uh, Jimmy Hart and, 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 and Slick and all these other, and even two. Uh, characters like Miss Elizabeth and uh, and Sensational Sherry, another great, great manager, and uh, uh, Luna Vachon, uh, for that matter, too. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, we were speaking before about uh, one of the the main role of the manager to be uh, the person that uh, is the mouthpiece uh, for the for the wrestlers. I, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about some of the. Some of the managers in history, there have been a few at least that, that weren't such great uh, orators or, or talkers, as, uh, if you will. Uh, and it, it always kind of strikes me as interesting. I was wondering what you thought about this, about, uh, say, like a Mr. Fuji, who didn't speak English so, so well or with a strong accent. And, and his strength uh, wasn't in wasn't in cutting promos, wasn't in uh, his ability to talk, but this guy also a former wrestler that, uh, that could get involved in the, uh, matches. Uh, one of the things about managers too, was it was that they could influence the match or the finish of the match without, um, either, either wrestling combatant taking a loss in the match. Do you know what I mean? Like through interference and disqualifications and such like that. So I always thought it was interesting about, for us, uh, managers such as Mr. Fuji or uh, another one of my childhood favorites, uh, Sheik Adnan El Casey from the uh, AWA, was quite an interesting uh, manager as well. Again, his English not so great. He was actually from uh, Baghdad, Iraq, so he spoke with a strong accent and would sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, just sink down into Arabic and just start screaming in, in his mother tongue and it. it it absolutely riled the fans up. It uh, kind of 
cemented his otherness, so to speak, that he was not an American like uh, like all the other fans and all the wrestlers and viewers. He was this other guy that spoke a different language, and sometimes he would just break down and start yelling, uh, cursing in Arabic. And it, I just remember how much that we used to work up the fans, and they would get so frustrated that he wasn't speaking English waving around a sword and such like that. And I always liked the, that kind of manager too, that wasn't just the mouthpiece, but that uh, uh, had a physical role involved in the matches and, uh, and and came at the managerial role from kind of a different perspective like that. Yeah, and I agree with you. I remember growing up on uh, Mr. Fuji as well too. And uh, one of his best aspects simply was just that presence at ringside. He didn't need to speaker on behalf of his uh his clients or who he was managing necessarily i mean you know when he had guys this physical size of a yokozuna and stuff like that i mean actions speak larger than words in those cases anyway but uh the one strength of fuji's was you know he always had those little gimmicks or whatever he had the salt that he could throw in the eyes or something like that to yeah. you know cause that like you said to cause that finish to happen without really taking a lot away from your babyface character in the meantime and still drawing a lot of heat back on his particular uh wrestler that he was managing at the time and i do particularly remember the uh run with yokozuna there in the uh 90s and a lot of that feud with brett the hitman hart at the time and stuff like that and you know a lot of the salt in the eyes was what would then cause brett hart that loss like at wrestlemania 9 there which you know he, obviously it was a good way to put the belt on yokozuna without making you know brett hart look completely like a chump after that uh, great title run that he had at the time yeah yeah i agree with you there like that and I think that some of these guys, uh, like we were talking about, many uh, successful managers were successful wrestlers in the past. And I think um, some of those guys, if they wanted to continue in the business but weren't able to do the physical uh, aspect of it, uh, and, uh, if they were had been loyal to the promoter and and, uh, and a friend of the family and such like that, that they could... Uh, still have a job in there and still create heat and still uh, be engaged with the fans. It would be someone that the fans and the older fans as well would, would remember and recognize. And, and uh, it, it's a familiar face and you can still use a person like that in, a, in the role of a manager type person. Definitely so. And I know uh, that eventually we're going to want to start talking about uh, the role of managers today or why they're not so prevalent in the wrestling industry. Uh, did there anybody else you wanted to cover before we uh, move over to that topic here, Papa Smokes? Um, no, it's, it's like you said, we could probably go on forever about all the great managers. There's a whole bunch of them that we haven't mentioned in this, but I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to just go off about some of the main ones, about some of the very influential ones uh, before we get to uh, managers' roles in uh, in uh, current day wrestling. For sure. Let's uh, move on over to that topic then and talk about uh, managers in current day wrestling. As you did mention, there are some that are still active, like Paul Heyman managing Brock Lesnar. But we are seeing less and less of the whole managerial role in the wrestling industry today, and that is the current topic, Papa Smokes. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Why uh, are we not seeing as many managers in professional wrestling today? Yeah, uh, I had been kind of puzzled about that question for a while because, it, to me at least, uh, managers are, are colorful and uh, color up the, uh, the wrestling landscape a bit, uh, uh, just wacky characters that are that are non uh, com non in ring competitors that can uh, that can really uh, make a make a show or a broadcast much more interesting with uh, some good talking and some good uh, uh, s some uh, verbal skills and, and some heckling of the audience and such like that uh, but I, I really think that the uh, a big part of the reason is that as the wrestling business changes and as uh, there are new competitors coming up, there is such a uh, uh, such a focus put on not only the, the wrestling skill and the, uh, the, the look of the body through training and such like that, but that wrestlers starting now are working a lot more on their promos. Um, they know that that's uh, a skill that you must have in nowadays uh, in in the wrestling world nowadays 
and that uh, you can't really just count on having a manager or them them finding a manager for you. Uh, I think that uh, just nowadays the uh, skills of the wrestlers are, are meant to include uh, promo uh, talking and such and uh, and uh, giving interviews and uh, getting their point across verbally. So I, I I have the feeling that part of the decline of managers in wrestling today is just uh, an increased uh, focus put on having skills on the mic as a wrestler and not just relying on your in-ring skill. Like, what do you think about that, Munson? I definitely agree with you, uh, in a sense, for sure. Uh, I think there could be a little bit more to it than that as well, too. Because, I mean, we did mention about uh, ring presence around the outside of the ring, not always having to be so much on the promo side, but what they can offer to somebody. Like, if you've got, like, say, a young up-and-coming talent that, you know, like maybe they physically don't look like the top guy in the company and stuff like that. But given the right manager at ringside, I think that it would be very beneficial for some of these young guys to have the right person down there that could cause that interference or whatever it takes to really start to put them over and make people uh, buy into the fact that this guy will be used and utilized as a top person in that particular company and helps for them to get over in the long run a little bit faster as well too. Uh, that being said, I think that there, you know, there's more to be said about why they're not being done. Uh, you know, a lot of that I feel could also be due to some of the travel, right? You get a good manager behind somebody and they get used to that, but say promotion B that's a couple provinces over or into the index country or something doesn't want to necessarily, you know, spend the double amount to bring two guys in as opposed to bringing in just one guy who they can either have wrestle a straight match or get on the microphone himself instead of having his manager there to cause anything of the sort. Uh, that too, I also feel like maybe there's a misconception out there amongst uh, fans who are looking to get into the business about what it all, what's all involved. I think that everybody has this idea of what's involved you know you can go talk to your local promotion and they're gonna suddenly put you into a role as a manager or a referee or one of the you know or a commentator for that matter right papa smokes but i think the a lot of people feel like you just walk in you start helping out and next thing you know you're there and doing that and stuff like that and in some cases yeah that might be slightly true but there's a lot more to it people don't realize that you know it takes the dedication of the in-ring work you have to learn the ropes you have to understand what these guys are doing in the ring to even start to be a part of the on-screen talent in any way shape or form and i think once people find out that they go to their first session to go and try to learn this kind of stuff because they're told hey you have to go to one of these camps or something like that and they get in there and realize oh shit i've got a lot of work to do in order to be a manager or something like that and they back out quickly so there might be these people who are very talented on a microphone or could really add to the stories and stuff but because their lack of you know ability to want to push themselves further draws them back from ever going and becoming a manager in this industry uh, my thoughts personally anyway yeah, I think you're probably spot on with that two months, and particularly about uh, uh, promoters seeing uh, sometimes uh, managers as, as an extra, you know, as an extra guy to pay, as an extra guy to um, make transportation for. Uh, so if you remember, like talking about Jim Cornette, uh, he was getting paid as much as any of the wrestlers uh, during his time in the NWA and then uh, Mid South Wrestling uh, because he was. He had so much TV time and uh, and was an active participant. So, uh, you know, I think some of those promoters just look at a show as well. I got to pay four guys for a tag team match anyway, but I got to pay five guys because one of them has a manager. And and, it, and if a if, uh, manager is worth his weight at all, then, then he's probably making this the same or very similar to what the wrestlers make. That would have been a... a a consideration for sure and uh yeah i also agree with you about the second part of that was that uh um some managers have gone into the business thinking it would be kind of a part-time thing and that they you know they don't have to take bumps and they don't have to do everything that all the wrestlers do but in fact there is a lot more to that job than what uh, many people think and, and it is a tough job and it, you are um, having to display some of the same skill sets as the in-ring uh, wrestlers as well. And uh, that could be a drawback too, but 
I noticed that uh, there are a few, uh, there's a couple of managers kind of coming up in uh, NXT now. You might have to help me out with that. Uh, uh, there is, uh, I can't think of the guy's name right off the top of my head, but I think there's two managers in NXT right now, which is kind of a good sign that, uh, that they're, uh, they, at least the dub is not completely uh, forsaking managers uh, these days. Well, for a while there, they actually had Paul Ellering out for uh, a while with the AOP until they got called up to the main roster, which I thought was a great dynamic for a young team like that, having Paul Ellering, of all people, at your side as your manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great idea, uh, Ellering. You know, obviously, you manage the same style of team uh, to, to spectacular success in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we all know who that is, the Road Warriors, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope it comes back a little bit. I hope that uh, that, that some uh, federations will still consider using managers. And uh, I, I didn't want to finish this segment without giving a shout out to a couple of our more homegrown talents. Uh, uh, none in, uh, in Saskatchewan that I know of at this time, but uh, of course we have out in uh, out in Edmonton, Alberta. We got Thaddeus Archer the third. He's really taken the taken the managerial role to heart and I, I like watching his work and uh, also to mention uh, Finko, the Ukrainian sex machine out in uh, Winnipeg. <laughs> uh, ask uh, Mike McSugar and Michael Allen Richard Clark about that guy. They've been managed by him numerous times and very uh, humorous and excellent manager, uh, excellent talker. Uh, will get you over if you hire him as a manager. So uh, I just wanted to mention uh, some of the current uh, Canadian talent we have in the managerial world, too. Definitely so. And you know what? Uh, never opposed to growing that talent a little bit more. Just uh, going to say, don't have to be a video bro forever. The managerial th thing is on the table at any given time here. So anybody watching, if you're looking for a manager, give me a call. I'm looking. So... <laughs> I'd like to see that, Munson. I think you'd be good. Uh, I think I think I'd love to give it a go one day, but you know, definitely, there's a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes of uh, running a show right now. And uh, you and I have our role behind the camera at the moment, definitely as the video bros. But uh, you never know. Once uh, we get enough interest and enough people back into the training facility and stuff like that, who knows what could happen there, Papa Smokes? Before long, maybe you and I will uh, step up from the video bros role into something new all together there for PPW. I like it, Munson. You're always thinking big. That's right. You always got to think ahead. That's the idea. Think forward when it comes to the wrestling industry. That's what we love to do. So uh, any final thoughts that you have for us here today on Ring Respect, Papa Smokes? No, I don't think so. I, I, I like this uh, talk that we're having. I like the format of the Ring Respect uh, podcast that we've got going, and I like the uh, rebranding of the Video Bros uh, video network going on and on youtube but encourage all the listeners out there subscribe to it and you can uh, get our new content as it comes up onto the internet and uh we just love to have you listening to our uh, takes on professional wrestling and and our little deep dives into the past and definitely so and you know what we want to get you guys more involved as well too so you know definitely engage us in the comment section below but also you know what if you've got little videos that you've got for at home right now while you're in quarantine something talking about the wrestling industry something talking about the video bros network or you know hey if you're just hosting a little bit of fun with you and the kids wrestling around in the front room hey send us the video well let's have some fun here on ring respect and keep the content going as well too we'll definitely have some fun upload it hey maybe we'll even do some reviews of people's uh in in living room matches or whatever as long as you aren't out there killing yourselves i mean what the hell let's have some fun right there papa smoke <laughs> yeah sounds good to me let's do it uh, interact with us and uh, we'll all have a good time perfect definitely check us out on all social media platforms as well uh you can catch myself and papa smokes not only here on the video bros network but also on prairie pro wrestling as we've mentioned many times before so go check out the prairie pro wrestling channel on youtube where you can find us as regulars the commentary team on there as well too and see our work as we are the behind the camera guys as well also so check that out 
subscribe to that channel, subscribe to our channel, and turn on the notifications as always. And hey, do us one extra favor, share this around on social media. We know there's a lot of you out there that are paying attention that come across this. And you know what? All it takes is one quick little share to get some people interested and give them a form of entertainment during uncertain times. I want to thank all of you once again for tuning in to Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network and hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much for joining us, Papa Spokes, and we hope that everyone takes care and stays safe.